Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Myopic Ortho K, a wave introduction. Uh, for tonight's webinar, if you have any questions on any of the uh, subjects related to Myopic Ortho K, go ahead and input them at any time into the chat box, and uh, we'll address them at the end of tonight's webinar. Uh, if there are any kind of questions about any other topics related to wave or contact lens fitting, go ahead and throw those in there. We might not get to them tonight, but they'll help guide future content, and uh, we might be able to direct you to past content that can answer those questions. Without any further delays, Dr. Ken Mahler. Good evening, all. Thanks for coming out to uh, webinar number five. Myopic Ortho K Wave Introduction, and we're going to be talking about Ortho K tonight. I know it's a very, very hot topic for a lot of you, so I'm glad we finally had a chance to uh, get to this one. All right, let's see here. First, uh, the housekeeping out of the way. Uh, I am a consultant for Oculus and Wave. Uh, I'm a, uh, a private solo practitioner in a contact lens only practice. Uh, in Fort Lauderdale, and the practice is pretty much uh, solely focused on uh, irregular corneas, as well as any regular corneas are in ortho K. Uh, I previously did national support for WAVE users that needed help uh, for WAVE, and I've also done uh, formal lectures uh, and webinars for WAVE, uh, much like I'm doing tonight. Uh, in addition to that, I do offer private practitioner consultation services uh, and that is not through WAVE, uh, that is through myself and the doctor, and I will talk a little bit more about that near the end of the uh, uh, webinar tonight. Uh, and I do beta testing on uh, both the CSP, the WAVE, and the AXL WAVE, and uh, currently guiding some WAVE training uh, as well. Now let's move on. Uh, this is the uh, fifth one down at the bottom there, Myopic Ortho K WAVE introduction. The previous ones are uploaded on the WAVE. Uh, website, uh, and so you can take a look at some of the preliminary uh, webinars that I had done uh, prior to tonight. All right, so let's get into uh, wave lens designing for myopic ortho K. Understand that uh, what I'm going to be presenting here uh, in this webinar is information uh, that I've really accumulated over the uh, past uh, 30 plus years that I've been doing. Uh, myopic ortho K uh, and uh, offering those services to patients. Uh, some of that is certainly not within the uh, typical uh, recommendations uh, that have been sort of been promoted through uh, various uh, journals uh, and the like there. And I'm really presenting what has worked very well for me uh, to make uh, my practice more efficient and uh, achieve much, much better results much more rapidly. Uh, tonight, I am going to only be presenting information that is uh, related to myopic ortho K, and it's within FDA-approved ranges. So some of the assumptions about designing for myopic ortho K. So this is sort of like a, a checklist that I think you need to go through for yourself because you don't want to step into uh, an arena that you're really not prepared to uh, deal with, both in terms of uh, uh, starting uh, with the uh, designing and uh, then following through with all the problems that can come up with a case that doesn't go quite as well uh, as you had intended it to do. So some of the assumptions are that you're capable of identifying a good topography from an unacceptable one. The reason for this is that if you start with bad information, trust me, you're gonna end up with a bad result. There's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Uh, it's really, really hard to uh, fix bad data uh, with a, an improved design. Uh, hopefully, you've had some gas permeable lens fitting experience. That, that is always helpful that you're at least comfortable in the gas perm arena. Uh, if you haven't done any gas perm lenses, ortho -K probably isn't the first place you should start. Maybe a single vision lens would be a little, little safer and a little easier. Uh, understanding that pupil size is a vital parameter uh, when you're doing orthokeratology, and you need to figure out how you're determining pupil size. If you're doing it from the topographer, and that's not the pentacam, 
it's dependent on the technique that you're using for video capture. For example, uh, I uh, still use my Scout, and I am accustomed to when I take the Scout, utilizing the lighted source inside the Scout, which constricts the pupil a little bit, uh, in a room that has the overlight, overhead lights turned off, but the ambient light from the reading, uh, st the stand um, uh, light for uh, reading, on and angled toward the ceiling, so it gives me an ambient light for the other eye. That creates a pupil of a very specific size, so then when I look at it on the topographer, I know exactly what type of pupil I'm dealing with, and then can design an orthokeratology lens related to that particular patient's pupil size. Corneal size is another one of those very important parameters to understand for ortho K, and you have to figure out some reliable and repeatable methodology to determine that measurement, whether it's measuring it on a uh, an image that's been captured on the screen, whether you take out a, uh, a, a PD rule and you can read it right off of their eye, or if you have a reticle on your uh, bio microscope. But you have to figure out some reliable way so that you can get a, an accurate uh, corneal size of the patient that you're fitting. Okay, we also want to, or hope, that you've had some degree success, successfully fitting uh, a wave lens already. Uh, wave uh, has its own learning curve beyond just ortho K, and uh, you really do want to have a, um, a familiarity at least with some of the controls and the displays that are on the wave screen. You also want a basic understanding of ortho K, uh, its principles, theory, the modern lens designs, and hopefully you've had at least some experience fitting some simpler ortho K cases before diving into some of the more horrendous type of uh, cases. Uh, so this introductory goal is really to address the common concerns and problems that arise uh, with ortho K, and that's what I'm hoping to achieve today. Uh, additionally, I hope you're open to uh, some different viewpoints regarding the design and the management issues because uh, I've come up with these uh, management uh, parameters over the course of years uh, and this really does work very, very well for me. All right, so why fit ortho K? Have you done more than 50 cases? How many uh, years have you actually been doing ortho K for? Did you start with ortho K from a program system such as something like CRT, CRT or uh, VS, uh, VST or the BE system or the Dream Lens, some ortho K in a box laboratory offering? Understand that WAVE uh, is a clean palette where you can really design what you'd like to do, and as a result, you really don't have sort of the safety net of a lot of uh, what comes with these uh, pre-done uh, designs. For example, CRT has very, very specific guidelines, uh, as well as restrictions saying don't try doing certain cases above certain RXs. And, and in terms of corneal shapes and, and, and the like. And with WAVE, you certainly can do that, uh, but that also allows you the opportunity to get into a lot of trouble. So you really do want to understand that this is very different than utilizing a, a box of ortho K lenses. Uh, do you use other ortho K lenses such as Contax and uh, Dream? Now, people who tend to get into ortho K seem to start on children, but that does not mean that ortho K is really only for children or only for myopic uh, management. You really can offer this as a vision correction modality just as quickly as you'd offer a pair of glasses or a pair of contact lenses, which I've been offering as an alternative to glasses and traditional contact lenses for all the years I've been doing ortho K. And as a result, I have a lot of adult patients in ortho K. So how many of you fit more adults than children? Adults are considerably more challenging than children for a multitude of reasons. And do you take your own topographies? That's very important because if you're just being handed topographies, you may not really understand that the topography data is tainted. Uh, I do all my own topographies and know at the time that I take the topography whether or not it's satisfactory for designing. Uh, so if you have trained staff that is taking topographies, uh, you may want to take a little extra time to train sort of an overseer to make certain that the topography that they're taking uh, is adequate for designing an ortho K lens before the patient leaves the office. 
All right, so why fit orthokeratology? Well, just a couple of practice and clinical management pearls that I want to throw out there for you because I think orthokeratology is a fantastic modality and a great option for so many patients that are just not really being offered this. Uh, from Gelmar, uh, he would uh, pointed out that there's three facets that the patient sees in the practice uh, of price, service, and quality, and you really need to pick the two that you want to focus your practice on. It is impossible to offer all three. You're not going to give a very, very low price with high service and high quality. Uh, they're mutually exclusive types of things. So pick the two things you want to do uh, and offer those. Now, typically those who are considering orthokeratology are more focused on things like uh, uh, premium services and, and top quality uh, care. And so understand that price is going to suffer on that and it's going to be a little bit more costly for the patient on that side. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because they're paying for fantastic work that you're going to be offering to them. Um, the expert becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, Gary Gerber also uh, commented about why should they come and see you? What makes you different than the doc down the street? And orthokeratology absolutely makes you different than the doc down the street, especially if you can offer uh, fantastic results. And that word really does get out there. Now, as far as my own, I always do what's in the patient's best interest. Uh, I've had so many patients show up in my office looking for orthokeratology, and I'll steer them away from orthokeratology because I think there's something that's actually in their better interest. Uh, on the other hand, uh, orthokeratology may be what's in the best interest of the patient, and I might try and steer them toward that and tell them why I think that that's a better choice. The nice thing about doing what's in the patient's best interest is the care that you deliver is never wrong because it's always the best for the patient. Always explain the services to the patient, even if this isn't a good option for that particular patient. So very, very often I will talk about orthokeratology to a patient sitting in my chair that absolutely cannot have orthokeratology, and that will sometimes lead the, the uh, conversation into, you know, this would really work great for my friend Frank. And all of a sudden you'll have a referral come into your office because you were speaking about these services to a patient that even though it wasn't appropriate for them, they knew someone that it was really good for. When you're doing this, though, you really need to give written materials. Uh, it's a lot of information. They can't talk to their friends about it because their friends don't know anything about it. Uh, they zone out while you're uh, presenting information. They forget. They misunderstand. Uh, there's information overload. Uh, and then uh, I was reading some study, I don't know how many years ago it was, that uh, uh, examined a physician's office and they came up with the 80-60 rule. And what the 80-60 rule was that 80% of what you say isn't heard. But interestingly enough, what is heard, that remaining 20%, 60% of it is wrong. So you have to understand, you may think you're doing a fantastic job of explaining things, uh, but unless you give written materials for them to review when they get home, they, they're, they're not really digesting and assimilating all that information. All right. This is a very, very important uh, concept, and I think it's uh, something that uh, often falls by the wayside, uh, is don't forget to be fair to all and charge what your time and expertise is worth. Remember, the best clinician in the world can deliver no care if they're out of business. So... You here tonight are taking the time to learn sophisticated design software, which WAVE absolutely is, and you're going to design a one-of-a-kind premium product to deliver these great results. This requires commitment, training, and expertise so that you can deliver these best results and clinical care possible, and that should be recognized and appreciated by the patients that you're providing this care for. All right, so what's in a name? This was off the top of my head. I did not work hard to create this list. I just threw it into alphabetical order. But this is what orthokeratology is currently going by. And I think that this is really a problem for ortho-K. And part of the reason why a lot of people don't know about ortho-K is that the actual service is really being diluted amongst all of these various names. And what are the, the public doesn't really understand that these really are all the same things uh, with some fancier names uh, attached to them. So I, I really try to stick 
with the uh, term orthokeratology. It's been the one that's been around the longest. Uh, it does describe exactly what's going on. I know it's not a, a sexy marketing term, and it certainly does not roll off patients' tongues. And so I will shorten that to, I'll mention orthokeratology, and then in our conversation, I will talk about ortho-K, because the, that they can remember. All right, so a summary of the modern basics uh, of orthokeratology lenses uh, divides the lens really into a four-zone lens, uh, four lens construction where there's basically a central flat area. Outside of that, there's a reverse curve area. There's then the alignment zone, which brings the lens back down to the corneal surface. And then there is the edge profile. You're going to do some type of corneal changes through the use of this type of a lens. And these changes cause central epithelial thinning, as well as mid-peripheral corneal thickening, which seem to primarily happen in the stroma. None of that is really debated. However, this one is. We still, after all of the papers that have been done on this, are still kind of going back and forth between how much is corneal bending versus how much is cellular migration versus cellular compression versus cellular proliferation. There's probably some combination of all of these things going on but it still is not really agreed on exactly what is happening to the cornea underneath our orthokeratology lenses. Okay, so now for the case that you're going to take on, these are some of the things you want to consider before you start the case. The current correction modality. So these are the five options of the person who you might be offering orthokeratology to. Uh, they have no correction. They may be wearing spectacles only. They may wear soft lenses as well as spectacles. They may be wearing a gas perm lens. They may even be in current orthokeratology. In that order, that's increasingly more difficult in terms of the patient that you're going to take on. So the person wearing nothing is by far the easiest patient to do, and the person who's currently ortho-K tends to be, or gas perm lenses and then ortho-K, tend to be the most difficult. There are a couple exceptions to that, but in general, when you're thinking about well, is this going to be an easy case or a tough case? Think about this list, and that, that'll sort of give you, get you into the right uh, frame of mind for that. Uh, notice I, I labeled that ahead of prescription. A lot of newer people coming into Ortho-K are very uh, taken by, so how high of a prescription can we take care of with Ortho-K? And quite honestly, the prescription is not the thing that determines whether a case is, is difficult or easy. Uh, cylinders certainly can make it a little more challenging. Is it with the rule? Is it against the rule? Is it oblique? But again, prescription is not the only determining factor. Uh, topographical symmetry is actually much more important. Uh, we also want to take a look at the elevation distribution of the corneas that we're dealing with. The corneal size is very important. Large diameter corneas tend to be very challenging. Corneal irregularities, is there any irregularity on that cornea that's going to make the case a little more difficult? Uh, pupil size, as I mentioned earlier uh, tonight. Tear quality, for me, tear quality is probably one of the single biggest hurdles to overcome. When you have an eye that has uh, some form of ocular surface disease and the tear quality is suffering, that by far is one of the single more challenging uh, things to overcome with Ortho-K and getting a good result. Uh, patient expectations, obviously, those have to be set appropriately. Uh, and then, of course, their visual demands. What is it that they need to do? Uh, for example, if uh, they live their lives driving a truck at night, uh, glare that comes along from an increased spherical aberration of ortho-K may not be the best treatment for that particular person. And then, of course, the patient motivation. How motivated I like to be. And this sometimes comes up with the uh, kids. Sometimes the parents will bring in kids for uh, myopia management, and the kids have no motivation at all to do this. And a kid who's not motivated uh, is going to really uh, get in the way of you uh, delivering a successful result, no matter how good uh, your intentions are, or how determined the parent is, or even how simple the case appears to be. A kid that does not want this will not do well. All right, so let's take a look at a case here. This is for um, uh, myopic ortho-K on an adult. And we take a look at these uh, uh, topographies here. 
And this was an old case that I had just pulled up for this lecture. It was a, it was a 38 year old female that I had uh, taken care of back in 2004. It's almost 20 years ago now. And uh, she was an intermittent uh, soft contact lens wearer for about 15 years, had headaches with the lenses and was uncomfortable with the lenses. She does not wear her glasses at work. She had good tear quality. Pupil was relatively small at 3.4. And the HVID was very average at 11.8. She was athletically active, uh, a great deal of computer and paperwork though at the office. So this means that you have a myope that is utilizing their myopia to do all of that close work and uh, you know for their entire work day at the office both on the computer and the paperwork and understanding when you do ortho k they're not going to be able to take their treatment off they're going to have to see through that treatment so that may be an issue especially since we're knocking on presbyopia's door at 38 years old so the examination data we had um uh, spectacle va was uh, good at 20 20 minus According to her, she was happy with that. Uh, the Rx was uh, very simple, minus two and a uh, two minus a quarter and a minus two minus a half of sill. I refracted her at 250 spheres, so pretty much in line. And I got a fuse cross cylinder at plus a quarter because I really was concerned about how well she was going to do at work, uh, given the fact that she normally has about a uh, two two and a quarter built-in add from her myopia allowing her to do all that close detailed work all day long. So I decided to target the full Rx of minus 250 uh, in each eye. So this is a sort of a checklist that I would recommend you get in the habit of doing. I kind of do this just as a quick mental thing now, but I create a list of pros for the case. So in this particular case, the pros are the pupil is small. She's got a very average corneal diameter, which is excellent. The cornea was symmetrical. She had good tear film. And the spectacles that she's wearing was undercorrected, and she still felt that the uh, vision was acceptable. She was actually okay with the 2020 minus acuity. On the con list, uh, the refraction showed that she needed higher minus, and again, that's going to work against us in the environment of the computer and paper paperwork that she does at work uncorrected. So I was very concerned about that. The cornea, as you saw in that previous uh, picture when I showed you the topographies, was very uh, sort of greenish blue. Uh, so it was an overall very flat cornea. Uh, she's 38 with an increased amount of near demand, and she doesn't wear spectacles. And when she wears her soft lenses, she said she did get headaches with that. So again, I'm very, very concerned about how she's going to function up close with ortho K. So that was really one of my major concerns on this case. So here are the wavelengths that I had done for her. And these were the design choices that I made for uh, this particular patient. It's just a summary of those. And what you can see here is we had an HVID of 11.8. And so I made the lens diameter 11.4. Uh, the symmetry was done with a G-SIM. Uh, you can also see I have this displayed in axial mode. Um, on the top, uh, of the um, uh, quad display there, you can see the rose colored uh, number indicating that this was average astigmatism. Now, my rule for ortho K is I never averaged the astigmatism, but because this was done back in 2004, that actually wasn't even an option on WAVE at the time. And so when I loaded the case into the newer version of WAVE, it comes up and shows that the astigmatism, in fact, was average back then, which was the only thing WAVE did for, for you back then. You just didn't have any control over averaging it or unaveraging it when you brought the data in from the topographer. I did target the full Rx of uh, the minus 250, which you can see entered in the spectacle Rx. The center thickness is uh, 0.22 for stability, and the edge thickness is 0.30. Uh, which most people uh, find surprising that I designed very, very thick edges like that. And I put the asterisk there because so we're going to talk about that in just a moment. The apical clearance on the right one was uh, just uh, around four microns, and the left one was at four microns as well. Uh, the power uh, of the lens, which would be sort of equivalent to the Jessen factor, 
was plus 146 diopters on the right, plus 145 diopters on the left, so about one and a half diopters of uh, plus. The horizontal sag of the right was uh, 2089 microns, and the left was 2085. And that is one of the checks that I kind of pay attention to when I design up my lenses. If the two eyes look relatively the same, I do expect that the sagittal depths of the lenses out at the periphery to be pretty close to each other as well. And you can see here that they were within four microns of each other. So that was actually a very, very close and good correlation. All right, so here's a picture that I created to, to explain why I do the uh, thicker tier, uh, thicker uh, edges on my uh, lenses. Center thickness is a parameter that you really need to think about in terms of uh, adjusting the uh, stability of the lens on the eye to make certain that it's not flexing uh, on the eye and you actually are giving the amount of treatment that you want it to give without the lens bending and giving way to other forces. And I will use almost almost always 0.22 would be the thinnest that I would go, but as the RX goes up a little higher, I will increase that center thickness. Uh, given that this was a very average a minus 250 uh, case, uh, the 0.22 is what I used. Now, on the edge thickness, this is purely speculation on my part, but I have, I have tested this, and this does seem to play out clinically. The problem is no one's ever bothered to do any research on this, so I can't tell you that there's a study that I can point you to and says this is exactly how it happens. But what this does by thickening out that edge is you can see on my diagram on the right there, I drew the arrow where it says increased edge to the edge that's lifted up a little bit higher on the thicker, um, uh, the thicker profile uh, created when I thickened up the edge to 0.30. And what ends up happening is, is that green zone that is uh, above the uh, pink triangular area labeled tear reservoir is the increased wet reservoir that is created uh, by the meniscus being lifted up higher to uh, get to the edge of that lens. What that seems to do is it seems to provide a reservoir of additional tear flow underneath that lens. And remember at the beginning of this, I said tear compromise is certainly one of the biggest problems that I've had to overcome in ortho-K. When you have a compromised tear film, ortho-K never goes as well as it should. And by increasing this tear reservoir and sort of giving the um, uh, area under the lens enough tears to work with, this seems to actually help the results. So, these fluid dynamics are changed by, uh, by that thickened edge, and it absolutely seems to make a positive impact on the results of cases. Interestingly, years ago, uh, Jim Edwards, the uh, original creator of uh, WAVE, uh, was listening to a lecture I was giving about this very, very topic, and he was very experimental, and uh, he suffered a little bit with a dry eye, but was doing ortho -K on himself, and he went ahead and designed up a pair of lenses with a very thick edge, just like I had recommended. And the first thing he noticed was that his lenses came off much, much easier the following morning. Uh, and so they didn't seem to uh, get stuck to his eye as readily. So this absolutely does impact the fluid dynamics, and it's all in a positive way. So I would highly recommend the thickened edge. 0.30 is the thickest that Wave will allow you to design. And that's, that is what I would use on every one of my uh, myopic ortho K lenses. All right, my dispensing visit is a little bit different uh, than the typical dispensing visit. Uh, the patient comes in and I check their uncorrected uh, vision in this particular case. Their vision was about 2200 in each eye. I applied the lenses and then I will, once I put the lenses on their eye, I will just have them sit there in an upright position with their eyes gently closed for about two minutes. I'll then guide them into the uh, biomicroscope and tell them as soon as I'm ready, I want them to open their eyes and count to 10 before blinking so I can see what the lenses uh, look like uh, as soon as their eyes open up. Uh, in this case, they were well positioned, they were well centered. I then will put some fluorescein into the uh, eyes to see what the fluorescein pattern looks like, and this one looked exactly as I expected it to. And then I brought her down the hall. Back then I was doing one and a half hours. I now do two hours. Uh, but one and a half hours, I brought her into an exam room, laid down an exam chair, and let her, let her take a nap uh, for the one and a half hours. 
Uh, I don't remember if she happened to have fallen asleep, but a lot of patients actually do fall asleep. And I tell them to, uh, when they come in for this, to bring a, a pillow, a blanket. If they want to bring some music to listen to with headphones, they can do that. They can even talk on the phone for an hour and a half or two hours if they'd like to do that as well. But I want their eyes closed. And a lot of them actually will uh, just go to sleep. After that, I'll bring them back into the uh, exam room and I will take a look with the biomicroscope to see what the lenses look like. Uh, these were well scented, freely moving. There was uh, negative staining, negative microcysts, no debris. By examining the lenses immediately upon uh, the eyes opening, that gives me insight to exactly what these lenses have been doing for the past two hours uh, underneath that lid, as well as gives me insight as to how the case is going to proceed. And at this stage now, based on that observation and that clinical assessment, I will then lay out an exact timeline for what I expect this patient to experience over the upcoming days. Uh, the uncorrected acuity was 2025 20, minus in each eye. Uh, I felt that that was a good ortho K of, uh, fit and effect. I'm seeing well. I went through the application removal and care, nightwear only as a regimen, no open eye wearing, recheck in one to two weeks, and at that time I was using optimum solutions. Uh, I then also dispensed the warnings, uh, expectations, and marketing. So my warnings consist absolutely of don't lose the lens down the drain. Uh, you do need to clean these lenses uh, with a firm hand. I know you're going to be intimidated. You don't want to break them because they're expensive, but you do need to clean them, so don't just tickle them. Uh, make sure there's no air bubble underneath the lens upon uh, lens application. I give them a timetable for vision, warn them about the halos that they're going to experience over this upcoming couple of weeks or so, and then tell, tell them to tell all their friends that I'm the best in town. Instead of coming back, she came back four weeks later, so she was on her own schedule. And uh, history was nightwear only, comfort was poor. Uh, she's still having trouble getting the lenses on, but she said the vision was good and she had no near point complaint, which certainly was one of my biggest uh, concerns on this case. Only had a slight starburst and the lens were off at three and a half hours when she came in at this point. The uncorrected vision was 2020 plus uh, with a plano refraction. And uh, both eyes open, she was 2015. So acuity was excellent. Uh, nothing going on at the biomicroscope. And the topography, these were her topographies and they were good maps. When I take a look at these maps, this is kind of what my evaluation consists of. How well are they positioned? What's the homogeneity of the discrete zones? Uh, so for example, the central zone on both of these, you can see is basically one single darker green color and that's surrounded by a lighter green color. So there's a lot of homogeneity to the very specific regions that I'm looking for. And then crispness is how well defined are each of the zones? And these, these certainly look very, very nice, especially considering this is a low myo. So I went ahead and addressed the problems. I, um, I do lens modification in my office still to this day, uh, and I re-edged re those lenses because I was not happy with the lens that was on them, and I applied them. And she immediately reported they felt great. They were much, much more comfortable now. Uh, and uh, I then went ahead and reviewed certain techniques so that she would have an easier time uh, getting the lenses on. I told her to continue with these for um, uh, one month, uh, wearing them night, nightwear only. I'm not going to make any changes at this point because the vision was so good and now she was very comfortable. Uh, and then I also gave her the instruction about using the Q-tip to clean up the uh, ocular surface. Uh, that's to make certain that you're getting debris out of the reverse curve. So she showed up nine months later. Again, she was kind of on her own schedule there. And she was nightwear only, seeing great, still some starburst at night. And again, the lens were off for about three and a half hours. Uh, vision 2020 minus in each eye. And this time she had a little bit of a refraction showing up. Uh, with some cylinder there, which did improve the acuity. Uh, nothing going on at the biomicroscope. And in terms of the maps, I felt that the right one looked a little bit better than the left one. And we could see here that centrally, the right one actually looks great. And the left one, it's a little bit splotchy looking. Again, I assessed that position, the homogeneity and the crispness, and I would assess that left one as sloppy. So the acuity slightly decreased. So I went ahead and I checked the lens specs and I resurfaced them. That's why I'll take them into the room and actually clean them 
uh, with the modification equipment. Uh, continue nightwear only, and I was not going to make any changes because I wanted to see her back in a week to see if cleaning up the lenses cleaned up that left eye. And if not, I would reconsider uh, designing these lenses to better address the starbursts. So she came back two weeks later, so I guess that those problems really were uh, bothersome to her. She said the vision's good, but she's still seeing some starbursts, and they were off about four hours at this time. Uh, acuity, more or less about the same. The cylinder's still there. Um, this time, she had some coalesced uh, PEK uh, on the right eye down at 7.30 and on the left eye at about 4.30. The maps looked pretty good. So you can see that the, the right one still looks good, and the left one looks a little bit better than it did before, but she's still complaining a little bit about those starbursts. The also, if you take a look at that left one, it looks like it's slightly decentered, And so I felt that that was not really helping out our situation in terms of the vision or the uh, starbursts there. So since she had those problems and it was slightly decreased VA, uh, and I found that little bit of minus there, although it was cylinder, I decided to address the RX. So I was going to design them with a slightly larger treatment zone, increase the treatment to minus half in each lens. So the way you do that in Wave is actually very, very simple. The lens changes that I made was I took the uh, red ball, the red control ball, from 6.2 out to 6.8, and the blue ball from 6.8 out to 7.4, and I increased the red ball lift another half a diopter. So that gave the additional half a doctor of treatment that she was manifesting in the uh, refraction. Uh, nightwear only and recheck a couple of weeks later. So she came back 13 weeks later, so clearly I did a good job because she wasn't coming back complaining. Uh, night vision, uh, night, nightwear only, vision was good, the starbursts were improved, and the lens were off four hours. She's back to 2015 minus, and nothing going on at the uh, scope. Continue with the uh, those lenses and recheck each six months thereafter. So that was how I managed this particular adult ortho K case. So a couple of summary uh, points from this case, I think that are important. History is vital to uh, prior, starting, uh, prior to starting the case because you really need to know what you're kind of getting into. She had um, a poor uh, soft contact lens wear history and uh, the limited spectacle wear at work were very, very concerning for uh, me when I uh, took this case on. Uh, if the initial topography data is good and the design is good, myopic progression, uh, well, I'm sorry, myopes progression of improvement or how well the ortho K works, it's very predictable and it's very rapid. And then the starbursts in this case were well addressed uh, with the additional um, uh, increased treatment area and incorporating the additional refractive data of the half diopter. All right, so here's case two. And this is for a, a child myopic management case. Uh, and this was done back in uh, October of 2018, so it's a more recent case. 10-year-old white female. Uh, Rx is one-year-old at minus three and a quarter in each eye sphere. And I refracted at 350, so not a lot of progression there. A quarter diopter and only, only the one year. Health was good. Uh, nothing unusual going on there, and everything else in the exam was pretty uh, boringly normal, and that was all great. Uh, she did not wear her glasses full time, however, and she's had no contact lens history, and the parents were specifically interested in ortho -K for the myopic management. So I had a conversation saying that, well, I understand, you know, she is already a 350 mile at 10 years of age, but I understand she really hasn't progressed all that much in the last year, but they still really wanted to put her into ortho K uh, to make certain that she got no worse than the 350. So I targeted the full 350 uh, for uh, her ortho K treatment, and these were her maps, and you can see there on the uh, Pentacam scans there, that the cornea is very normal, nothing unusual going on there, uh, on the uh, top curvature maps as well as the bottom elevation maps. So how do we design for this? Again, that little pro and con list that I kind of put over in my head to make sure that I know what I'm really getting into. So she had a small pupil, average corneal diameter, cornea was symmetrical, good tear film, moderate myopia. That's all really, really good for us. However, she did not wear her glasses full time. And that indicates to me that here, even though she's a 350 myope at 10 years of age, she's very comfortable walking around blurry. And so that would concern me from a motivational standpoint 
because is she going to be motivated enough to really wear these lenses every night to make certain that we're getting good treatment. So here are the lens designs that I had done. And the design choices I did for this are summarized here. Uh, HVID is 11.8, so the OAD uh, was 11.4 and 11.5. More than likely, the reason for the difference between 11.4 and 11.5 was somewhere in one of the changes I made, uh, I inadvertently shrunk or increased the diameter of the lens, and that's how they ended up 0.1 difference, because normally I would design them the same size. Uh, GSIM symmetry. Uh, this time, because it was 2018, uh, it was unaveraged, so you can see the lavender color in the upper uh, left area of the um, uh, quad, quad uh, graphics display. I targeted the full RX of 350, center thickness again at 0.22, and an edge thickness of 0.30. Apical clearance was 7.6 on the right and 5.2 in the left. That is a little bit high on the right, but I felt pretty comfortable with the design. Uh, my lens power was 171 on the right and 171 on the left, so they were really identical. And the, the lens sag in the horizontal was a little bit different, uh, a little bit more different than I would typically expect, but I let that slide uh, on, on this particular case uh, at 2144 and 2207. So there is a difference there of about 60, 60 microns, which is a little more different than I would typically let go. At the one year, she did great, and at the one year exam, uh, which was uh, actually just about uh, 13 months later, uh, she was nightwear only, lenses were off for about four hours, her uncorrected vision was good, she was having no problems, she did occasionally miss nights as I kind of anticipated she would, uh, nothing unusual with her health, uh, uncorrected acuity was 20-20 minus in each eye, uh, refraction was basically dead on target there. And if we take a look at her topographies, we can see they looked absolutely beautiful uh, with the curvatures on the top and the elevations on the bottom. One and a half years later, however, so that was uh, earlier last year, March, uh, it's about what, 10 months ago, um, she came in, nightwear only, but due to COVID and being home, she only wore the lenses rarely and sporadically. So this, this really was the concern that I had right at the beginning. And because of COVID, and now that she really wasn't going anywhere, she really didn't have the motivation to wear the lenses. And then a couple of weeks prior to coming in for this appointment, she lost the lenses. And so she was wearing her old glasses, and she said that her vision with the spectacles was good. So if you remember, she had those three and a quarter uh, diopter spectacles. Uh, I checked the vision and she was 2200 with those spectacles. And so that was a little bit concerning as to why was she not seeing well since she was only a 350 mile when we had started uh, two and a half years earlier. I refracted her and she refracted up at minus 550 uh, and spherical equivalent on the left was five and a quarter. So she advanced dramatically over that one and a half years that she really wasn't wearing her Rotho K lenses. Take a look. We could see that she's really not treated. Those are the topographies I got that day. And I wanted to redesign these lenses uh, for her so we can get her back on track because now she's a five, 550 mile up and a five and a quarter mile. Up. So I put on the table there on the left the right lens uh, that she had been wearing. And now on the uh, right side, the number two lens was the new lens I was designing for her. So size was the same, GSIM the same, on average the astigmatism the same, targeting the full RX, uh, which was two diopters higher. Nothing changed on the center edge thickness. The apical clearance was about the same, but my power value increased from the 171 to the 370, which was the two diopters difference that I needed to treat the additional myopia that she now had. And the lens sag uh, was still about the same. So I didn't really change much about the fit. On the left eye, uh, once again, the left side of the table is the lens she was wearing and the right side is the newer design. Uh, size remained the same at 11.5 G sim on average astigmatism. Uh, I targeted the full RX of 350 now up to the five, five and a quarter, so 175 higher. Uh, center and edge thickness was the same, apical clearance was about the same, and you can see there on the power that I had boosted up the power, the 175 that she needed, and lens egg was about the same as well. So three months later, she came in to see how well we were doing. She was only wearing them uh, at nighttime, and now she was not wearing, uh, she was not missing any nights at all because she had a meltdown after seeing how much she had progressed over that one and a half years, and she said she was not going to miss any nights moving forward. So she was off two and a half hours from the lenses. The uncorrected vision was very good. She wasn't having any problems, but she had said 
She had a little trouble with the left one um, last night, uh, the night before putting it on. So the left eye seemed just a little bit off uh, when she came in today. Uncorrected vision was 2020 on the right and 2030 plus on the left. Uh, the refraction, you could see right eye is dead on target. The left one was a little bit off. Uh, some strange cylinder there that popped in there. And you can see here the maps look really good on the right. And the left one, we could see that little central irregularity, which is contributing to the astigmatism uh, manifesting itself in the, um, uh, in the refraction. So let's go through some uh, questions here. This is a webinar series that's intended to provide this fundamental educational knowledge. And so if you want anything covered uh, in the future webinars, please submit them in the chat box. We're going to go on to resources. These are the private consultation services that I offer to all of you guys out there. Uh, there are basically five options. The summary is that uh, these are all intended to go for more advanced learning, uh, off FDA approval, much more complex designs, and this is going to really be from much, beh much beyond Waves Help Desk. Uh, there's the case-by-case -case help where uh, I'll take on a case uh, as the case presents to you. And this is really where you learn as you go type of thing where you can um, take on a case, maybe the case isn't going so well and I can bail you out, or maybe it's a case you feel is just a little beyond you and you wanna see how I would take it and so I can do the case for you. Uh, there's the phone help uh, per time units and that's typically usually an hour at a time. And that's typically designed to help very specific cases or to bail out a case or to go over very specific concepts. There's a one-on-one -on -one personal time, which is really a whole day of uh, targeting very specific weaknesses or goals that you have in mind for your particular practice. Uh, design and supply doesn't really apply to wave doctors. That's only for the non-wave doctors. Uh, and then there are the DVD sets uh, from the workshop that I had done a few years ago. Uh, that's basically a very comprehensive overview of a wave over a, a wide range of topics, clinical applications, theories uh, for ortho case, sclerals, irregular corneas, et cetera. And that website down at the bottom there is the address where you can uh, find all of this help available to you. Sneak peek for the new wave that's coming out, hopefully in a couple of weeks at GSLS. This is what wave is going to be looking for. And you can see it has a very, very different uh, look on it. I have been involved with the uh, beta testing of this, and I am very excited to see where this is going to be going. Uh, there are quite a few features there uh, that are very advantageous uh, compared to the current version of WAVE. And then the uh, end over here are the WAVE resources that are offered through WAVE at the wavecontactlenses.com site, uh, where you have the uh, WAVE page uh, offering clinical support and technical support and IOS and all of that. The resource page where these webinars are stored in videos as well as events that are coming up. And then of course the online WAVE users group uh, that are done through Google uh, where you'll get emails where we discuss cases and peer-to-peer -peer advice. And with that, I'm going to call it a, a night on this particular lecture. And thank you all for coming on out and uh, listening to what I had to say. I really hope this uh, information is helpful to you guys and allows you to elevate your uh, ortho-K practices uh, that much higher and makes them much more efficient.